approached by Chris, did we want to get involved in this musical, which is a great opportunity, as we've never, I've never done anything like this before, so I'm excited about it, yeah. I think it'll be good fetching everyone together, getting to know different people. I think it's going to benefit everybody like that, yeah. People will see what we're doing and they'll get enthused about this and come along themselves. Yeah, I think, I think that each rehearsal every week as we get better, you know, that that progress that we're making, I think that's what I look forward to a lot, to see which how much progress we can make within the coming weeks. OK the Musical is part of a larger project just called OK that um, is, is a, uh, at its core, a project about the history and lore of a small town, Kinderhook, New York. Um, and when I was thinking of how to, to exhibit or, or manifest this history or rework this history, I was looking at different formats, trying to pull things from the town itself and um, just drier exhibition formats uh, or writing wasn't quite um, f seeming to fit or inspiring people locally from where I'm from. So then, um, but, but one of the elements of the project is, is a, was, a, was a musical. And um, of course, everyone understands what a musical is immediately. Maybe some people think they don't like musicals, maybe people don't want to participate, but um, the musical became a way of going into t many, many deep historical topics, uh, as well as a way of engaging lots of other people around it. Tate Liverpool's been doing a program for a number of years in the spring slot, which is usually about a collaborative community engaged piece. And this project is actually linked to a wider European Union funded project called the Collaborative Arts Partnership Programme, in which several organisations across Europe receive some funds and are um, tasked with working in collaboration with artists in their communities. This includes organisations in Germany, uh, Finland, Ireland, Spain and of course the UK. Well the commissioning process uh, had a commissioning team which is an internal team and we put an open call out across the European partnership but also across all of our networks. So this open call attracted something like 160 proposals from artists and collectives right the way across Europe. So out of 160 the commissioning uh, team um, whittled it down to three that we wanted to interview. So we interviewed three and OK the Musical stood out heads above everything else um, for its um, authenticity really and its, uh, its detail um, and the imagination and inspiration of sharing this history really of a small town that we have no idea about. For this particular project, we um, partnered with Super Slow Way in Lancashire, which is an Arts Council funded people and places project, um, and they were equally as excited to, to be part of this commissioning process. Um, and we were able then to look not just across Liverpool and Merseyside um, for, for other partners and, and participants, collaborators if you like, but we were also able to work with local people in, in further north in, in, in Lancashire, in Pennine, Lancashire, um, in the four wards that Super Slow Way work with. So the first group that um, we contacted was Choir With No Name. So Choir With No Name uh, is a choir for people who have been affected by homelessness in one way or another. They meet every Wednesday at Blue Coat, and so it's a very 
easy thing to pop into, sort of, uh, because it's very regular, also for the members. And they have a lot of volunteers that also keep that, the numbers up and keep the momentum and keep the energy positive. When we first started doing it, I and the choir, I know, thought it was absolutely bonkers. Well, it still was bonkers, but just the, the idea of it was just so what? And we'd, we'd never worked on original music before and we'd never worked in a musical before. And there were so many elements that were so new to the choir. And obviously doing a musical about this tiny town in America that no one's ever heard of, um, just seemed like, what is going on here? And, um, but then as it, as it progressed, it, it became so evident um, how exciting it was and how, also how important it was for the members because it was so different, it was so new. Uh, so, so the choir has been fantastic because it uh, provided like a base for the, for the project, for musically. Um, another group um, that we worked with that also meets at Blue Coat is Blue Room, who's uh, a group for adults with learning disabilities who go and do all kinds of creative projects, mostly making art. They also deal with Blue Room's exhibitions and, and uh, investigate art, art, ideas about art and all kinds of things. So they came here and I went there back and forth and they ended up making a bunch of props and costumes. So we initially met Christopher here. He came into our workshop and studio space and tell us a little bit of background about the idea of OK the Musical. We initially started by creating some theatre posters to advertise this musical that had yet to be formed. Um, and so the, the Blue Room artists really sort of let their imagination run wild on some of the characters um, involved in the story, like the legend of Sleepy Hollow and all, all of those characters. And that really started the relationship between the group members and, and Christopher. And then we then followed that up with trips over to the Tate um, when the, the theatre was built in the gallery and the group members then began to make some of the props um, and wearable sculptures for the, for the production. So we had people building um, the, the cardboard constructed costumes of old Kinderhook and painting them in the gallery space and making props and things for the performance. So that was kind of how, how we contributed to the, the production. Another great group was the Valley Street Community Textile Studio, who is based in Burnley, run by Sue Reddish. And they uh, came together to produce a banner for the musical. They did a surprising amount of research into the Kinderhook, its buildings. They came up with a design of the banner. They went through the different legends and folklore a bit. So you have like different prominent historical buildings from Kinderhook that they made uh, with embroidery, couching, quilting. And um, yeah, they made an amazing banner in a pretty short amount of time. Um, another group was Ground Up, who is, a, who is an inclusive arts organization in Burnley as well. And they make arts and crafts projects basically. So they ended up making, spending quite a bit of time uh, detailing their uh, paper mache giant heads, which were worn in uh, one of the scenes by the Burnley, mostly by the Burnley kids, and a few adults. And, um, and then they also made some cardboard food and other props and fire and things that we just, that were need, needed to sprinkle around the various sets. I also worked with YPASS, Young Persons Advisory Service, which has been based here in Liverpool for 50 years now. Um, they have all kinds of different programs. We mostly just pulled a few people from their Thrive program. So I was going to YPASS every Monday uh, late afternoon and then we would sing a bit, paint stuff, make stuff and um, they ended up making some set elements and, and uh, performing in, in a couple songs. I also worked with the Royal Court Theatre Community Choir. Most of the people in the Henry Hudson encountering the Mohican scene and, um, and the Great Blizzard and Fire of 1888 scene were, were from the Royal Court Theatre Community Choir which is a great bunch of people. So we had the, the Burnley Troupe which was just like a bunch of people. Some of the women from that were in the textiles uh, studio as well, and then a few other families that took part. Um, and they made sets and props and also acted and sang, and so we were learning three songs. Also same with the OK cast in Liverpool. It was kind of an assembly from here and there of some of the Royal Court theatre people, as I mentioned, and then um, pretty, pretty random at some point. Um, so, so it was a mixture of yeah, preformed groups 
and then groups that we had to, to mishmash together just to make it happen, including the costume team, the art department, the, the media team. Yeah, and of course, then we have um, Family Collective, who's based at Tate, and um, Debbie and Denise uh, usually do a project based on an exhibition at Tate, but this time we kind of integrate it directly in, and they ended up producing a shocking amount of, of the things that we used, including the house costumes, which are made with the public mostly. People, some people who I've lost even track of who they were, though I met some at the performance. When you have, you know, 40 kids running around, it can get pretty out of control. Meanwhile, we had the textile group working on the banner bust in from Burnley. We had like a rehearsal. We had a blue room was in that day too. So there were some really intense days of a lot happening. But through, through those kind of mish, mashing everyone together and also the banquets and the performance at the end, I think a lot of people got to meet each other a bit. I think it works so well because it's kind of like, um, rather than the community coming as a spectator, they're actually participating. So it's, this, it's kind of like art imitating life and life imitating art. So at the same time, it, it involves the viewer. You know, you, you could come and paint, you could come and create, and then be a part of this vision and seeing it play out on a stage before you. So I think that's great, and what better place than the Tate Gallery. It is to yeah, make it as a group and build community and have a community playing in other community. And I think even the backstage people are, are acting in a way, because they're acting as, as a stage crew, or they're acting as a, um, as a costume department. And, and they're not really. I mean, they are because we say they are, and we all agree, but um, they're still kind of, it's all kind of everyone's role playing something. And that's kind of the thing that's nice about it is that everyone just gets removed from their from their daily life. Tate put me in touch with Chris because I'd done various bits of work for them before in musical capacities and also I had run a community orchestra, experimental orchestra in Liverpool so I had a sort of network of local musicians who would be kind of interested in getting involved. I love community projects, that's something that I've done a lot of. I like the mix of working with quite a disparate group of people, I like working with amateurs and non-musicians and sort of seeing what comes out of things like that so that's a field that I'm interested in anyway. Uh, when I first spoke to Chris I could see that he was also shared a lot of those interests and when I saw some examples of previous OKs that he'd done the aesthetic of it and the sort of vibe of it just looked a lot of fun so I was kind of really keen to get involved with that. Uh, so once we had all the plays in place we had a few rehearsals in my house and we started to learn the tunes. Chris came along and kind of oversaw and gave us guidance, gave us a bit of context for where the songs would fit within the story or the, the kind of vignettes of each scene. And I don't think we had a single rehearsal with everyone there. So it was very much a kind of do what we can and hopefully it will all come together. And then I'm just trying to remember that I think a couple of rehearsals we had in the tape with the, with the actors and kind of in situ. Uh, so that was very much 
pulling it all together and trying to make it run as smoothly as possible. Uh, I seem to remember we were fairly nervous about getting it ready in time, but it, it did come together and it was hairy at times, as these things always are, but that's part of the fun of it, and it was, that kind of adds to the excitement on the day, I think. I think OK the Musical has been really effective as a piece of socially engaged practice because it started off with the quality of the invitation, really, um, from the artist to the people of Liverpool and Lancashire. And I think that quality and that authenticity is really important. Um, and you can tell that from how Christopher Klein, the artist, really um, uh, establishes relationships, continues relationships, not just with people in the gallery, but everyone that he encounters. Um, he has been such a pleasure to work with. Uh, I think what, what, why that's been so interesting is because um, he he's kind of demonstrated such a generosity to the groups and the project that I, I don't actually think I've necessarily ever seen in a project that we've done here like this before, um, in that he, he really has been in it and among it and has worked with people in, in such a genuinely collaborative way, um, which I think is, is why it worked. So, you know, obviously he had the vision, he knew what he wanted to do, but he managed to bring together such diverse group of people to deliver something. I think that's, it's actually pretty inspiring to see that. I wouldn't have been here, except I brought, I saw it advertised the, the, in, in, uh, in one of the local What's Ons to the community, and I brought my two granddaughters a week last Thursday to do a bit of making and things in, in the way. And I happened to get in front of Chris and he asked me the direct question, do you act? And I said, no. I said, I've never acted in my life. And he said, do you, do you sing? And I said, yes, badly, he said, but I actually do play my guitar around the acoustic and music clubs. So he said, well, will you do a, a, an audition for me? So I did an audition and he said to me, well, you know, we'd like you to, well, I'd love you to be Martin Van Buren. And I said, well, I'll have to think about it quite honestly, because he chose me. And so I did, and overnight I went home and I let him know next day that I would do it. If he had the confidence, I could do it. So that's why I'm here. thing about it it was very hands-on you know so every time we sort of visited even you know as a, a customer at the take um, you could see the whole thing develop in front of your eyes you'd go one day and everybody would be doing a little bit of artwork around the table with their children etc and that sort of thing and then the next time you go people are like painted on walls so you actually felt a part of the whole process of the production and I think that's what I liked about it because you could feel like all your senses were getting involved into the woodwork, if that wants for a better word. And it was nice to see a project like that actually taking place in, in, our, in our Liverpool, so it was lovely, it was quite an honour. I guess what's different about this project is it really involves broad and diverse audiences in coming and being and doing in this building and being part of it in a very, very different way. I think kind of what the space has done is almost sort of be a positive disruption, if that makes sense, because for a lot of people, I think, who visit museums, what they see as an exhibition is a space with white walls and painting on, on those walls. And this is obviously completely different. We have crazy amounts of colors going on. There's all these different props and things like that. 
and it was a developing exhibition. So, I mean, we still talked about it as an exhibition, but it was kind of an immersive installation. Um, and all of it is part of the artwork. So it's not just the final performances, but it's, it's everything and everyone involved and everything that they were making. And um, so I think in that sense, it was very interesting to look at the whole process as the final piece rather than just looking at the end result. I think uh, people who've come and seen the, seen the space, have been in the building and seen it from the 1st of April through, will have seen something that looks completely different to anything we've ever done before. They will have felt this is completely different. They might have seen Picasso here or Turner or I thought, what, what the hell is this? And so hopefully, some people would have been kind of quite disrupted in thinking about what might go on in a gallery and that would have been quite stimulating and potentially challenging. Um, some people, they will have come here for the first time ever to come and see this project or be involved in this project and so for them, um, they'll just think this is what Tate Liverpool does. They'll think, well, this is the kind of thing that goes on here. And I guess what that's what we want people to think is that almost anything can happen in this space, that's what it's for. Initially when um, we'd made kind of a, a, good, a good go of it, the general public were allowed in and, and that was when I suppose when that space actually came more as an exhibition and being part of like, that living experience and um, it was really refreshing actually um, to actually have the public come and speak to you and ask you what you were doing and what you were contributing to it and then eventually um, you know, contribute to the final, the final product as well, but just that interaction or that kind of social engagement with the general public, um, turn that space into something new, which I suppose is what Chris intended for it in the first place. For those who were involved, I think it transformed, it, it, it sort of expanded the comfort zone of coming into this space. Uh, and I think that that is essentially um, expanding and opening access uh, because it will mean that those children who have designed dinosaurs or masks here um, last month, when they will come back here, they will certainly find it less intimidating than they did three months ago. Uh, and they will uh, understand this space as a space where different things can happen. Since I became an artist, um, I always thought that, you know, having a use of a space is an amazing thing to be offered so um, whenever I see an exhibition I usually judge it in part this doesn't always work but in part by um, you had this space and you could do anything with it and this is what you did so so when I see a show you know some, that there's always room for poetry and minimalist gestures and things that can be great too but in general myself and some of the other artists that I work with regularly like we like to really utilize the space and, and make something happen and make people feel it and, and change it um, into your vision. There is a sort of a, a shift happening really with, in contemporary galleries, modern and contemporary galleries, and there's a shift happening where social engaged collaborative practice is, is moving more to the forefront. Um, and we wanted to do that here in a, in a big way. We wanted to signal that Tate Liverpool is changing. Um, we're changing, contemporary art practice is changing, um, we've always been at the forefront and we want to stay at the forefront um, as a gallery. But more importantly for me, we want to support artists who are working in this way and make sure that actually our communities are connected to arts practice in a much more em emotional way um, and a much more equitable way. People were, some people were saying like, I had a media community center and a guy was 
kind of ordinary guy was saying like, why should a kid from Burnley Woods care about your town? And I had to tell him like, well, I mean, you guys don't have a beanstalk growing out of Burnley Woods, but you could still, you probably do Jack and the Beanstalk plays in school and stuff and people mean something to people or provides at least like a format to, to go through some sort of, of your own mythology, your own um, situations. Uh, so in a way, Kinderhook is just the background folklore. For some people, it doesn't matter at all. Some people didn't even know until the last day when they asked me that Kinderhook was a real place. Some people didn't know I was from Kinderhook. Some people didn't know that I wrote the songs. So I don't know what people were thinking half the time, but they were liking it. <laughs> so everyone finds what, what, it, what it means to them. That never heard of Oh, Kinderhook before. I just thought Chris was winding the up, but like towards the end of it, well, at the end, it wasn't a pay, it, it wasn't an imaginary person. We were singing about a real person, if you like. And I don't like history that much, but that was pretty exciting. I do smile now when I, when I hear the word okay. I do smile knowing I've got that little bit more knowledge that I didn't have before when I first started. So it's like a personal thing that you know where it came from, it's like where the home of it was. So it's a li it does make me have a bit of a warm smile just knowing, knowing me know, knowing that that's where, where they come from. So yeah, it does make me smile now. It's um, a good history lesson and good for teaching people history of other places that they might not know of. Because for me, I didn't hear about old Kinderhook until, you know, until Chris came along. So, you know, for me, I've learned a hell of a lot in a short space of time. I guess it takes you outside your comfort zone in a way. And you, you meet people you wouldn't have met before. You're willing to put yourself on the line a little bit, you know, and do something that you may not have done before. And it, in doing that, it probably helps you to realise what your possibilities are, limitations of other people, your own limitations, and to help each other get through those. I'm really looking forward to is because people are from the community have come in at different days we've never worked all together like at one point so it'll be nice seeing how everyone's separate work has come together to make a, a really big thing like I just see the orchestra over there and it I'm just excited already it's just proper awesome and it feels proud well I shouldn't say it I feel proud for being part of it and being given, I know I keep going on about this voice, but like, I'm proud to be part of this big voice that's going through. The best part I would have to say is meeting and dressing so many people from so many walks of life. It's been great. So. Um, from little girls to the men and women in which we've clothed. It's, it's been fun bringing their character to the role and seeing how we can best, uh, best interpret the story. I think the bigger part of it I've learned is that when you get people together and work on a common project just in quite a short time what they can achieve really. I think it's been really amazing commitment from people to put it together in such a short time. I think it's tremendous, and I think it, it, that's Christopher's magic, actually, that he's made people feel that they can bring themselves into it. And that was what was really evident. And um, everybody's idiosyncratic personalities became this whole that was a proper community performance. Challenging. Um, it's been. It's been. Oh, it's been so nice. It's a really amazing piece of work, and Chris should be so proud because it's brought so many people together. And it's just been so wonderful. So nice to be a part of it. I 
enjoyed everything. It's been, I've enjoyed meeting new people as well and, you know, working with a range of drum young and old. It's part of the future of art. I think art should be um, exciting, inclusive, it should make people think and it should make people feel something and I think that this has absolutely achieved that. Just, just describe, describe it in one word. Ooh. Well, okay doesn't do it justice. It was fantastic. <laughs>